M S W Media. The rule of law is not just some lawyer's turn of phrase. It is the very foundation of our democracy. The essence of the rule of law is that like cases are treated alike. That there not be one rule for Democrats and another for Republicans, one rule for the powerful, another for the powerless, one rule for the rich and another for the poor, or different rules depending upon one's race or ethnicity. To serve as Attorney General at this critical time is a calling I am honored and eager to answer. So yeah, now it's clean up on aisle 45 time. And for a long while yet, it is going to be clean up on aisle 45. Hello and welcome to episode 128 of Clean Up on Aisle 45. It's Wednesday, July 5th. I'm your host, Allison Gill. And I'm Pete Struck. Today we have updates in the E. Jean Carroll case, the New York Attorney General's $250 million fraud case against Donald and his kids, and proof from Jamie Raskin that, surprise, surprise, completely debunks James Comer and Jim Jordan's claim about Biden's bribery schemes. Yep, and we have a letter from Hunter Biden's lawyer, Abby Lowell. And if that name sounds familiar, I think it's because it's also Jared Kushner's lawyer. Uh, But that letter is to the House Ways and Means Committee, along with another letter from David Weiss. That's the uh, U.S. attorney Trump appointed to investigate Hunter Biden. And that that letter is from David Weiss to Jim Jordan. It's his second letter. And we have a weird solvency filing by Rudy Giuliani in the defamation case against him. But first, we want to thank some of our new patrons this week. And I hope everybody enjoyed our bonus episode this weekend for patrons. Uh, Pete was in rare form. Thanks, Pete, for that. <laughs> <laughs> Any, anything, least I can do. Least I can do in these crazy times of summer heat. <laughs> and yeah, it was the heat. That's what, that's yeah. what I would always yeah. say. Hey, hey yeah. I, just, I have to talk like that. It's the heat. Uh, so you got patrons, you make the show happen. Uh, we couldn't do it without you. So thanks to Mark, Nick James, Mel Court, Samuel Mestis, Kathy Azaro, Terry Alba, Lorinda, Susan Levy, Yen, Laura Dalton, Elise Boppel, Chella DeWy, Colleen Doherty, and Jeff Carr. Uh, if you want to become a patron, you can do that at patreon.com slash aisle 45 pod. That's A-I-S-L-E 45 P-O-D. If you're a $2 per episode main episode subscriber, you get that second episode every week for free. You get double the amount of episodes. So thank you so much. All right. So uh, first, let's cover the letters. We have letters. We have one from David Weiss uh, to, to Jim Jordan et al. And then we have one from Abby Lowell, Hunter Biden's attorney, a very long letter uh, to, the, to Smith, who is the GOP chairman of the House Ways and Means Committee, who, you know, kind of cherry picked and released information from, quote unquote, whistleblowers and, and tax documents uh, after a five year thorough investigation into all of that. Um, so first of all, Weiss, uh, David Weiss. He investigated Hunter Biden for like five years, almost five years. He was appointed by Trump. um, And Republicans in the House have made up all kinds of conspiracy theories about about this investigation. First of all, they say they have an IRS whistleblower who claims David Weiss was blocked from filing charges in other jurisdictions, like some IRS guy wanted to file charges and Weiss wouldn't let him. Um, We have another conspiracy theory that David Weiss asked... Merrick Garland asked Merrick Garland to make him a special counsel. And uh, Garland vehemently denied that in a recent press conference and went further. Uh, he, He went on to say, look, I gave David Weiss more power than a special counsel enjoys because I said, you can charge him anywhere for anything. I'll have nothing to do with it. I'll take exactly your recommendations. Uh, you don't have to clear it with me first, which is you know, usually something a special counsel does, although he has kind of given Jack Smith the same sort of deal. Like, I'm just going to take whatever recommenda- recommendations you you give me. Uh, same with the inspector general that was investigating the, the, you know, Horowitz that was investigating Jeffrey Clark and the, and the DOJ and, and their attempts to disrupt the peaceful transfer of power. But he's like, I gave this guy all of the leeway in the world. Uh, and so now... David Weiss has has written a, a second letter to Jim Jordan. What are what are some of your favorite parts of this letter? 
Well, look, I mean, I think it's clear that he is ba- he is limited in what he can say for a couple of reasons. One, there is an ongoing investigation in Hunter Biden, and he makes that very clear in saying, hey, guys, yet again, I'm telling you because there is this in- ongoing investigation. I will not provide specific information related to the Hunter Biden investigation at the time. But then he really explicitly says two things. One, the DOJ did not retaliate in any way, shape, or form against the Internal Revenue Service uh, criminal supervisor, special agent, and the whistleblower. The whistleblower claims that both he and his boss were retaliated against. And one of the things Weiss says very straightforward, without mincing any words, without burying it in some weird legalese, is no BS. There was no retaliation whatsoever. So he was very clear about that. And, you know, that's his first point. And then in his second point, you know, as you indicated, he said that, you know, I do have you know, I have been given this ultimate authority. It's interesting to me when you go on and read what he says, because he goes through and he says, look, typically the case is as a U.S. attorney, my charging authority is limited to my home district. And that traditional practice is if I want to bring a charge in a different district, I'll reach out to those U.S. attorney's offices to find out if they want to partner on the case. And if not, he can request what's, you know, to be designated what's called a special attorney. And for those of you who want to either attorneys or want to look it up, it's, um, 28 USC 15 or 515 gives the authority for um, the attorney general to appoint somebody, a special attorney, and that gives them the ability to bring charges in districts other than their own. So what he says, though, what I found was very interesting is that he says here, I have been assured that if necessary, after the above process, I would be granted 515 authority in the in DC in the Central District of California or any other district. So he's not saying I am asking or I will ask. It's a very much it struck me as I'm in the in the middle of some sort of process that if necessary after the above process and that's talking about reaching out to both DC and the C- Central District of California to determine whether or not they want to partner my read of that what one read of that is that that is still ongoing, that there is some discussion between he and his staff and the U.S. attorney attorneys and their staff in both D.C. and the Central District of California. Some of that may be, do you want to partner with us? But a lot of it could be a discussion about, okay, traditionally, how has the district looked at any particular set of criminal charges? What's the record of, you know, the appellate record in those districts? Because those are both, dis- you know, Delaware has a different circuit court of appeals than does D.C. and then does the Central District of California. So there may be a lot of discussion beyond just partnering to sit there and say, you know, are these viable charges? Are they reasonable charges to bring? I didn't get the sense from that wording that it was complete. And then, you know, finally says, look, when appropriate time, when this is all done, I'm happy to answer questions, but we're not there yet. So I don't, it, it is very different from a lot of the assertions we've been hearing from Republicans that, oh, he was turned down. He was told, you know, he couldn't bring charges. That's absolutely not true. In his own word in his own voice. He is saying, you know, I've been told I'm the ultimate decision maker. If and when this happens, I can ask for it. And I've been told that I'd be granted this 515 authority. So they, there, it, it undercuts a lot of the, you know, if you tuned into Fox and Newsmax or whatever this morning, or as we're taping it on Sunday, a lot of the uh, talking points that Republicans are still trying to throw out there. It's clear that nobody's been turned down. He makes again, at the outset, abundantly clear, there has been no retaliation whatsoever about the whistleblowers. And that, you know, and then, and I know we're, we'll talk about Abby Lowell's letter next, but that to me is really problematic. And, and why don't we discuss a little bit about what Abby lays out in this letter? Because that's when I look at like the wrongdoing and the malfeasance and kind of not very ethical behavior going on, it's the stuff that's coming out from internal IRS from processes. It. Yeah. And from Abby Lowell. Although I do want to say, I, I give it a little bit of a different read, what he says about, he says about, if necessary, after the above process, I would be granted 515 authority in anywhere that I felt charges should be brought. I don't read that as the above process, meaning the current, um, you know, plea agreement. I read that because he says after uh, I've been granted ultimate authority over this matter, including responsibility for deciding where, when and whether to file charges and for making decisions necessary. Uh, consistent with federal law, the principles of federal prosecution and department regulations. That part, the the principles of federal prosecution and department regulations, is what I read as the is as what the above process is. Uh, and so I I think what he's saying is that to me it sounds like it's over because he said 
if necessary after that, I would be granted 515 authority. But you're kind you're right. He it kind of leaves it a little bit like open. Like he's sort of like but, but yeah, there's because still it's a, a possibility current. if I if I wanted to bring yeah, because he says it's a current ongoing investigation, right. which is why he's not giving shit to these guys. But he, you know, then he also says, I have, you know, not that I can grant other people 515 authority. I've been granted 515 authority, if necessary, to bring charges wherever. So he's probably still looking at that. Although I I tend to think that this is probably the end of it. uh, Because, I mean, what else could you bring in another jurisdiction on two federal tax crimes and a gun case? Um, I, I don't know. But I mean, you know, he's basically like, I think the the crux is, is I I didn't retaliate. No one's retaliating. I have full authority. I'm not going to give you anything because this is still an ongoing matter. Whether he's talking about the plea agreement uh, or whether he's talking about looking at additional places and possibly getting 515 authority, but uh, he's he's either way. It's 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 very clear that he's like just shut up. <laughs> yeah, and it's you know we're we're par- I mean the the letter is very parsed and so we're parsing it and it is a current tense thing right and a a sort of future you know future I have been assured that if necessary after I would be granted it isn't I was assured that had it been necessary I would have been granted so again but he might right, be doing that yeah. simply because if he put it in the past tense maybe it's done maybe it's off the table but if he puts it in the past tense like that you would have Jim Jordan and James Comer and everybody else saying, well, look, it's done. Obviously, it's finished. It's closed. Come talk to us. So by putting it, you know, a reason might be that by framing it right. in the sort of current ongoing tense, he is, it's all consistent with all of this is ongoing. And I can't talk about it because it's ongoing. Once it's done at an appropriate time, I'm happy to talk to you. So, you know, we're, we're, you know, we're all guessing at this, but I would think he... Right, but I'm still not going to give you any grand jury information or right. law enforcement or any, you know. Right, although although anybody's guess as to whether or not, you know, IRS investigators are, are giving that to the committee. Um, and I think that was what, you know, you were pointing out about some of Abby Lowell's complaints, right? Yeah, we'll just do a Durham. I'm sorry, uh, that's not in my purview. Uh, I, <laughs> that's not uh, in my report. Here's my report. Enjoy it. And I'll answer questions about what's in the report. Um, but, you know, anyway, that's uh, that's a very interesting letter because it's it's basically a reiteration of what he told him on, on June 7th. Now, this Abby Lowell letter, Abby Lowell letter, that's hard to say. Just like you said, it's got so many. It It's very difficult to argue against somebody who has cherry picked responses and given out half truths and parts of transcripts it's without giving the entire story without there's a lot of back explanation that has to go into it and the republicans know that uh and and so some people just don't even bother making those explanations but abby lowell does so here in this 10 page letter and some of the points are pretty clear yeah and he like look what i think Sort of scoping back so people know, like when it comes to the IRS, when it comes to taxpayer information, in addition to just like any investigator, any federal investigator are limited in what they can legally say about ongoing investigations. Certainly if there's grand jury information that is, uh, you know, pre- that's secret and it's prohibited from disclosure, there are carve outs made for congressional oversight type activities. And what is happening here is not so much, you know, the, the argument. And I think, you know, Abby Lowell, yes, he is. Uh, Hunter Biden's attorney. So this is written in a way you would expect a very aggressive, smart um, defense attorney to be writing for public consumption. But he has a number of good points. And I think at the end of the day, you can make, and I think Abby Lowell does make, a fairly compelling argument that what is going on here is not legitimate oversight. It is essentially laundering this restricted taxpayer information, things about Hunter Biden's tax returns, think, things about the investigation, and under the guise of, oh, he brought it to Congress as an oversight matter, what they're doing is putting into the public record a great deal of information that nobody has, that, that people should have um, you know, protected, you know, the, the information about their taxes. I mean, God knows we are still waiting for any IRS sort of audit activity with Trump, but yet we have a quote unquote whistleblower who's out there giving all sorts of information about, you know, what Hunter Biden did or didn't claim on his taxes. Well, okay, we're all these whistleblowers about what was or wasn't done with Donald Trump or Don Jr. or Ivanka or Jared or any number of other sort of confusing things. We had, you know, New York Times exposés 
about real estate transaction information that are the subject of ongoing criminal and civil you know, activity in the state of New York, where are the whistleblowers at the IRS saying this was you know, likelihood of violation of federal law, and it was never pursued because of, you know, any any number of reasons why. So it, it strikes me as a oddly selective release of information. Uh, you know, Marcy Wheeler did a good post about some, you know, a whistleblower X, you know, a second unnamed uh, potential IRS agent who has real, the things that they are talking about, the, the, the activities that they're claiming to blow the whistle about don't really hold together in some of the committee interviews that are done. But I, you know, if I'm Abby Lowell, this is an absolutely, you know, it, it, there is some outrageous behavior going on. And I think he was, he does a good job of laying out all the different things about, you know, everything from like, Hey, you guys, you, you, you did, you had this screen grab of information back and forth that allegedly occurred in 2017. But Oh, guess what? In the screen grab, it's not, you actually have a picture from the white house Easter egg roll in April of 2022. So like five years after this alleged conversation took place. And furthermore, you have like the messages in a blue bubble, but if it's WhatsApp, it's going to, which this supposedly was, it should be in green. And there are any number of things where it's clear that this image was a doctored image and isn't the raw information. And Allison, to your point about like the sort of selective release and what the Republicans on the committee are doing, you know, Abby Lowell is, is highlighting. I mean, that's one of, you know, a bunch of different uh, examples that he highlights. Yeah, he also brings up, hey, you you put out this transaction with a person uh, from tax, you know, cherry picked from tax returns, and you say he did this, you know, made this transaction with a felon, but he wasn't a felon at the time and had no part in the transaction. Uh, he's so, like, just uh, little little things like that. Um, and his his opening statement, um, he says, since taking the majority in 2023, various leaders of the House and its committees have discarded the established protocols of Congress rules of conduct, and even the law in what can only be called an obsession with attacking the Biden family. Your recent actions and joint statement with Chairman Comer and Jim Jordan, this is to Smith on the House Ways and Means Committee, make it clear you've joined this ignoble group, adopting their irresponsible tactics as your own. In fact, yesterday's press release by a three of you seeking a testimony of a dozen law enforcement personnel based on the unsworn and slanted statements of the IRS agents is now the proverbial card castle, like it's got no foundation. Um, uh, according to the agents, the letter says, Biden committed clear chargeable tax offenses for almost every tax year from 2014 to 2019. And a set of IRS supervisors and Justice Department attorneys just don't care. On its face, that's ridiculous. The agent, and here's some points, the agent indicating that some, here's, these points are so, like, they blew my mind. One of the IRS agents indicated that some laptop was that the laptop was authentic. And that completely ignores the real issue, which is whether the data that has now been accessed, copied, disseminated, stolen and manipulated is authentic. Who cares if it's a real laptop you can hold? It's about the data on it. Uh, continued reference to an unsolicited email purportedly sent from a former business associate, Tony Bubalinski who coined the phrase, quote, 10 held by H for the big guy, right? We've all heard this one. By now, Abby Lowell says, a complete review of communications indicates, one, such a breakdown was never included in any agreement. Two, the concept was that of Bubalinski's with whom Mr. Biden never did business and about whom any of his views were deemed by his business associates as being Bubalinski's wishful thinking. And finally, that our client never responded to or acknowledged that communication ever. Uh, which is, again, just astounding. Um, also, uh, something else, the IRS whistleblower is accepting the right-wing theory that some purported laptop was abandoned, and I, I'm assuming they're talking, talking about the Mac shop in Delaware, when the agent had no basis to make that legal conclusion, which is being contested in a separate litigation, and stating the decisions of the prosecutors left Mr. Biden tax-free when uh, the agents know well that years ago Biden paid all of his taxes due plus interest and penalties. So that, coupled with the fake screenshots, I mean, it's just a complete takedown uh, of, of every single IRS whistleblower claim. And here's the deal. If you're an investigator, if you're a prosecutor, you make your case with a charging document, and then you take it yep. to trial. If you don't have a case, you don't talk about it. Now, there are reasons and times there might be a legitimate problem that a whistleblower action might be appropriate where you go to Congress. The responsible way to do that is you go to the committee, 
in closed session, you talk about what your concerns are, the people who are impacted by that from the Trump appointed U.S. attorney on down, the career professionals at the IRS and DOJ come in and you gather the facts. What you don't fucking do is what's going on right now, where you spill the details of every last little thing that then get turned around and spilled. And now you've got Hunter Biden, whatever you think about him. As a taxpayer, as a U.S. citizen, he's entitled to a presumption of innocence and not having some garbage committee member tarring his image when he hasn't been charged yet. What you yeah. don't hear me or any number of the team that were on working with Mueller in the time before that are going through and spilling the details of all the crap that was either redacted or didn't make it in the special counsel's report, whatever we think or don't think about it, because that's not the appropriate way to do something. And if you're yeah. going to go out there and you're like, somehow I have a different set of standards because this is Biden and crooked Joe and evil Hunter and the laptop and the dick pics. Shut up. There's one fucking standard. There's one fucking standard. And if you have a whistleblower problem, go to the committee, present your facts behind closed doors, let the committee who has subpoena power and everything else get all those Trump appointed U.S. attorneys, get a former attorney general Bill Barr in there to talk about it. Get statements from everybody about what happened, but don't sit there laundering this private information that you may or may not ever bring criminal charges. Because now what, what the hell is Hunter Biden supposed to do with this now? How does he get, you know, you looked into it, you used the power of the investigative power of the United States government to get all this information. And maybe, you know, you charged me and I pled out to these things, but all these other alleged activities, maybe you never charge them, but you've just thrown them out there to public consumption. That's not the way it yeah. fucking works. And these IRS no, agents should know better. And it's like the, the Sussman case with Joffe. And Joffe's like, I would love to testify, but Durham keeps telling me I could be indicted at some point in the next hundred years. So I have to plead the fifth. Uh, and he won't tell me what for. And uh, I mean, it's just, it's, uh, it's absolutely ridiculous, um, as we know. And we have more. We have more proof uh, batting down some more Jim Jordan uh, and and Jim Comer conspiracy theories about uh, Biden bribery schemes brought to us by Jamie Raskin. And we're going to go over that, but we have to take a quick break. Stick around. We'll be right back. All right, everybody, welcome back. We have more patrons to thank uh, before we move on on updates. Uh, with Jim Jordan and, and Comer. And then we also are going to talk a little bit about the E. Jean Carroll case. But thank you so much to Deborah Howard, Tammy Grimm. Uh, I just joined to hear bonus episodes of Pete Raging. Yeah, goddamn thank right. <laughs> <laughs> Beth Hot, Polly Melendez, Jeff Yazel, Frony, Lee C., Rosalie Hrubick, Pamela Reed, Mark Smith, Paul Prackle or Pratchell, Marcus Williams, and Generally Bad Advice. Love it. Thank you so much. Uh, all right, let's let's talk about this Jamie Raskin thing, because this is Jamie Raskin in response to this ongoing, well, we have an informant uh, who informed somebody who filled out a 1023 at the FBI. Well, that informant, uh, we haven't we can't find him now. Oh, he might be dead. Uh, we have audio tapes. Where are they? Oh, we're not sure they exist. Um, it's, it's all over the place, but that's what this is focused. That's what this is focused on. And we've been covering this for a bit, but ranking member Raskin has shared some key evidence directly contradicting those bribery allegations. Raskin says, quote, despite being interviewed as part of a campaign by Mr. Giuliani and his proxies in 2019 and 2020 to procure damaging information about the Bidens, Mr. Zlochevsky explicitly and unequivocally denied those allegations. Now, Zlochevsky apparently is the informant that's dead or can't be found and they have audio tapes of, but they can't find. Well, R Raskin found him. And he says, specifically, Mr. Zlochevsky denied, one, that any Bur that Burisma, no one at Burisma had any contacts with then former Vice President Biden or any of his representatives while Hunter Biden served on the Burisma board. And two, that former Vice President Biden or his staff in any way assisted Mr. Zlachevsky or Burisma. And uh, so this is all from a letter about uh, apparently Rudy talking to Zlachevsky or probably not him, but hearing about something he said from somebody else and then going to the FBI and says, you won't believe what I have. Uh, and, and, f which, and the FBI, because they have to, 
have to fill out a 1023 every time somebody talks to him, wrote it all down, looked at it, and threw it in the trash. <laughs> well, they kept it, but you know, they, they were like, there's nothing here. And now Raskin has the proof from Slachevsky, who apparently is the informant to the other informant, who is Rudy Giuliani, who was over there trying to dig up and actually fabricated dirt on Joe Biden with with his pals, his, uh, you know, the Russian backed Ukrainians uh, with paid bought and paid for by Dmitry Firtash. Uh, and uh, very interesting that right around that time, Bill Barr went over there uh, as well. Because uh, he was in Vienna at the time for Tosh, <laughs> and he was looking for Mifsud. I don't know. It's just a big old mess. But there's receipts now. Yeah, it is. And this whole thing, it reminds me, like, if you're a Star Wars fan, this is like going to Tatooine, right? And it's like the cantina band. And you walk in, and Rudy's got his fucking hair dye running down the side of his face. And they're all kind of bizarre folks in this sort of environment. And this is like, I'm thinking as a like Intel counterintelligence person, that, you know, 20 years of looking at it, you will find groups of people around the world that inevitably are information peddlers of dubious authenticity. And time and time and time again, if you want some information badly enough, somebody's going to pop up and claim that they have that information that they're willing to sell to you. And I don't care if it's proof about Iraq having WMD and Saddam Hussein developing it. I don't care if it's information about what Trump may or may not have done in Russia. I don't care if it's information about what Hunter was doing with Burisma or or anywhere else. Or even some potential Russian information that makes its way into the Chris Steele dossier, uh, which is right. why... Th that is, know. that is, there. there is always this element of people, of inf sleazy information broker, sometimes with valid information, most often not, sometimes with just a little bit of a drop of a flavor of something that's accurate, who are out there trying to make a buck. And they're trying to make a buck with any side they possibly can. And of course, then you get it all kinds of like, Intel services playing in there and that, you know, the allegations, which I, you know, firmly believe to be true, you know, that the Russians were deeply at play in seeding disinformation and Ukrainian intelligence actors and probably all kinds of other Intel actors as well, that this is very much when you look at it and you get Rudy, who is so doggedly going to find some BS, you know, evidence of something that never happened, but he so very much wants to see it. That he gets suckered in by the Lev Parnases and the, you know, Igor Frumans of the world, and he's setting out oh, got fraud guarantee sounds legit. Let's let's see where do I sign? I and just you know suckers himself into this, and we still see these are the ripples of that. These are these are the ripples that what Jamie Raskin is finding. The ripples of what was going on in 2015 and 2016, and goddamn Rudy because he is just a rube. You know, buy him a couple of drinks and he'll buy, you know, he's like Mikey instead of eating his, his checks or kicks or whatever the hell he's eating, he's drinking his Bloody Mary. Just, you know, give him enough to drink and he'll buy anything, allegedly. So I, it is not at all surprising that this amounts to nothing. I'm really glad that, you know, Raskin or somebody on his staff or somebody brought to him kind of really compelling proof that this was all a nothing burger. But again, it, it's how many years have we spent, and, you know, God forbid the elder statesman of, you know, Ron Johnson and, and Chuck Grassley, I assume, I know Ron Filipowski had a, you know, retweeted something at Chuck Grassley standing in, you know, shoulder high corn and made the joke that, you know, maybe he's looking for the source out there in, in the <sighs> cornfield. But it, it just, this has consumed a huge chunk of the, you know, certain elements of the Republican Party, including some fairly senior senators. And it's all nothing. It's all baloney. It's all bogus. And Raskin has the receipts. Yeah. He says, for this reason, the full factual context surrounding that form, the 1023, including Zlachevsky's statements contradicting the reported information, is crucial to properly understanding the allegations. In this case, that context includes not just repeated and failed efforts in 2019 and 2020 by Giuliani, Senate Republicans, and Trump's Justice Department to find support for these allegations. That includes Durham, by the way but also clear evidence that then-Vice President Biden's actions carried out the policy of the United States, its allies, and its international partners to combat corruption in Ukraine. And so, I mean, that's the long and short of it. it that should put it to bed, uh, but I bet my, pay, my paycheck that it doesn't. There'll be some other weird informant or 1023 that they'll want to look at in a skiff and come out and have a pizza party about, but, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll see <laughs> where this ends up uh, going, but, you know, Pete and I will follow it. Um, Let's talk about, uh, before we take a break, the, the E. Jean Carroll updates. So 
we we discussed this a little bit. We touched on it a little bit, right, on the uh, on the weekend bonus episode for patrons. But let's let's go over it now. Yeah. So Alina Haba doing what she does best. Um, <laughs> so first, the, the, in, in, in summary, high level thing. So a Trump filed a, a motion for summary judgment, which was denied. And he also claimed, well, I have this, uh, you know, uh, absolute immunity because I was the president, which was also denied. And so now comes Alina Haba without Joe Tacopina and had filed a counterclaim for defamation. This is this is Trump saying that he was defamed. Now, keep in By mind Eugene. that, uh, right, that Eugene had defamed Trump. Right. Um, now. Haba, and it's not clear how they're going to split the uh, the funding for this near almost one million dollars in sanctions for the lawsuit that Trump brought against Hillary Rodden Clinton et al, including yours truly, um, that was thrown out um, and, and was summarily dismissed, and then the sanctions again of you know nearly seven figures of sanctions. Um, immediately after that sanction, there was a similar uh, lawsuit against the New York Attorney General, which they immediately dropped, saying, oh, crap, because, uh, you know, in the wording of the the order uh, awarding the sanctions against Haba and the team, there was a reference to the fact that, you know, this might also, this sort of conduct might be going on elsewhere, and they dropped that uh, New York lawsuit as quick as they could. And then what, what's what's interesting is, you know, in this lawsuit, it, it's, the, the outrageousness of it is that Trump says Eugene Carroll was wrong to repeat the contention after the jury's decision that he had sexually abused her, that somehow that the lesser form of conduct w- was not accurate and that somehow that is defamatory. Yeah, because uh, Eugene went on to say a few times that he had raped her uh, and now he's saying, no, I only sexually abused you. Uh <laughs> And that's his contention and is saying that these these are defamatory remarks, which they are not just because a jury didn't find that they that his remarks were initially uh, defamatory, calling her a liar. So uh, but, you know, Robbie Kaplan, excellent lawyer, again, no relation to Judge Kaplan, who's overseeing both of these cases or oversaw the Carol two and is overseeing Carol one. Um, Kaplan said in a statement, her lawyer said. Trump argued in the face of reality, quote, that he was exonerated by a jury that found he had sexually abused E. Jean and went on to say Trump's filing is thus nothing more than his latest effort to delay accountability for what a jury has already found to be his defamation of E. Jean Carroll. But whether he likes it or not, that accountability is coming very soon. Uh, And she's talking about Carroll one now, the statements he made in 2019 and the statements he made at the town hall, which totally mirrored the statements he made. Uh, on Truth Social that he lost $5 million for. And as it turns out, he went to get a loan from a bank to to put a bond down on this $5 million payment for Carol too. And he was denied that loan. <laughs> Nobody's yeah. going to lend him a penny. Uh, and so he came up with $5.5 million in cash somewhere, somewhere. and deposited in a bank. And it does not say where. I mean, it came from uh, Takapina's law firm, but there's no indication of where that you know, I'm sure there is. It will be very interesting to see because I know there was some question or indication that Jack Smith might be looking at Trump's fundraising and, and what was being said about monies that were being raised and how those monies were being used. And certainly, you know, $5 million liquid is a lot of money. And so where that yeah, came from? Yeah, and if it's out of the Save America pack, you aren't allowed to pay your personal legal expenses that don't have to do with your campaign from a pack. And if you're talking to that pack, that's also a problem. Uh, so, uh, but he's so tightly wa- like wound around that pack. Trump is that there's going to be, I think, uh, something that comes out of Jack Smith's investigation into not just that pack, but four other ones. Um, anyway, uh, that's the update on E. Jean. We're going to keep uh, an eye on that. It's scheduled for January of 2024. Uh, but we'll see if that gets put on hold for some reason because of potential other cases that are in the works right now federal criminal cases documents case january 6 wire fraud for the big lie we'll see where all of these end up landing uh, on the calendar and in what proximity to the primaries and the election next year all right after we come back from the break we're going to talk about a weird filing from rudy giuliani that he didn't have to make uh he could have made it under seal and uh, a change in the New York Attorney General Tish James's fraud case, the $250 million fraud case uh, against his family. Everybody stick around. We'll be right back. Mm-hmm. 
Welcome back. So on to Rudy. But before we do, we have some more patrons that we need to thank. Thank all of you so much. This is just an amazing group. And as Allison said, you are, in fact, the folks who make this podcast possible. And so thank you uh, to Eck Stark, Ken Vogt, Kevin Terrell, Philip C., Karen Pavlik, Kate Rowan, Lisa Farley, Ruth Ann Gonzalez, Tina M. Davis, Michelle, what's her name? Desert Gal, <laughs> Pinkinia, Carla Reeves, and Mark Mettler. Thank all of you so much. Really appreciate your support and uh, can't do this without you. So, Allison, let's talk about Rudy. Rudy and his <laughs> bizarre, sad list of assets. Yeah, let me give you a let me give you a, a a little bit of background. I know everybody's been following this pretty closely, but Shay Moss and Ruby Freeman, two election workers in Atlanta, filed uh, Fulton County filed defamation cases or a defamation lawsuit against Rudy Giuliani. You know, for saying oh they were passing around USB ports like cocaine or heroin, and that there was a suitcase under the table, all that bullshit. Uh, Trump repeated some of these claims, although the Trump is not included in this lawsuit. They're just going after Rudy. Uh, and then up the, where Judge Beryl Howe is, is she, she, she drew this case, uh, former chief judge of D.C. District Court. And um, th this is the interesting part, because Rudy said, first of all, Ruby Freeman and Shay Moss said, hey, he's not handing over anything in discovery. And the judge asked Rudy, why aren't you handing over anything? He's like, well, I'm broke. It's going to cost me $350,000 to go through all this with the special software and paying people and I just don't have that money and she goes okay cool prove you're broke and she put in a minute order Pro she, you know to file a solvency report or whatever so show me prove it and then some filings happened under seal we don't know what but then all of a sudden he was sanctioned and then I guess in response to the sanctions maybe hoping for relief from the sanctions because he has to pay attorney's fees for for the whole filing about the discovery to Ruby Freeman Shamos He's now filed a solvency report, and he did it publicly. He could have done it under seal, but he publicly filed this. What does it say, Pete? <laughs> so he says that he there are some total of two businesses, Giuliani Partners, which has no lawyers, and Giuliani Communications, which similarly has no lawyers. And both of those entities have no assets Save some media equipment for one of them, I assume, you know, a, a boombox from 1988 that he kept <laughs> when he was working in Manhattan and, you know, 13 Does he hold it above his head yeah, outside he does, of mar Or, or <laughs> outside of Gracie Mansion or something that was like, I don't know what he did. And, you know, 13 unrecorded CD, CD, recordable CDs and a CD-ROM drive for a, you know, IBM desktop. But nice. it, they, there's, it, it boggles my mind that one, just looking at, the man's lifestyle. I mean, I don't think he's living in the way that he once did, but he also clearly is not indigent and without assets. And what I'm hoping is that between uh, the legal team of Shay and Ruby and or some business intelligence investigator types who are willing to do it for them or do it pro bono, I am willing to bet you that Rudy Giuliani has stashed away some resources that he has not disclosed in this. And I hope if that's the case, that they're able to find it and really slam them with it. Because it, it it boggles the mind when you look at sort of the the profile that he is still maintaining to claim that he's essentially, you know, again, $182 of old media equipment is the, the sum total of his assets. I don't buy it. So, you know, we'll we'll see. It's It struck me as a very, and it's a weird, you know, you made the point, like, why why do you want that? You don't have to file that publicly. I mean, it, it seems like he put it out in the public record. I don't know if it was to like help with fundraising or somehow generate. It might have been a mistake. Could sympathy, been... or could have been a mistake. And it's like it's it's written in a way that is not. I mean, it, it's a it, like it, when Manafort redacted that thing and filed it, but then you just had to copy and paste what was underneath. You know, Republicans can't tech. So right. <laughs> yeah, and certainly, and God knows, Rudy can't. Um, from from all the open source reporting we have about him, his various phones and his habits but with uh, Rudy. Yeah, his phones, and so you know, and again, I'm sure you know at this point, you know, God knows with how much the government still has of the material that they uh, seized from him way back in the day. That you know, again, keep in mind, everyone, that was. Some time ago, that was a more than a year and a half ago, I think, right? Maybe yeah, even and, two and years where they seized more that. More so. recently, the DOJ went in and asked for a warrant to get different information from that stuff, and that could have been related to January 6th. That could have been related to any number of things. Uh, 
and potential crimes, fraudulent elector schemes, so on and so forth. But he's, uh, I mean, he's, you know, what would be really funny is if he was like, well, where I live, I, my home is not an asset because it was gifted to me by Donald Trump, the Trump organization. And that then that, that puts another charge for, uh, you know, yeah. tax. Har- Harlan uh, Crow bought it and I'm living in it rent free. So <laughs> it's not it's not an asset. Right. Yeah. No, it's going to. Right. 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 Sorry, I'm mixing people up, aren't I? Um, no, it's totally, it's all the yeah. same kind of corruption. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, all right, let's go to the New York Attorney General. A New York appeals court on Tuesday, last Tuesday, rejected Donald Trump's bid to end the state attorney general's lawsuit, accusing him and his family of staggering fraud, uh, but dismissed all claims against Ivanka Trump and said the remaining case could be limited further. This was a 5-0 decision. The appellate division in Manhattan said state law gave James the power to police alleged repeated or persistent fraud or illegality and conduct lengthy and complex investigation and conduct lengthy and complex investigations many years after uh, suspected misconduct began. But statutes of limitations prevented James, who had probed Trump's business dealings for three years from suing over claims that arose before July 13th, 2014 or February 6th, 2016, depending on the defendant. Right. And it also says, because statute of limitations don't just apply to criminal cases. They apply to civil cases, too. And it depends on what state you're in, uh, what that statute of limitation is for what specific kind of crime or conduct. It also said, uh, the the court also said, all claims against Ivanka Trump have to be dismissed because they were filed too late and because she was no longer with the Trump organization at the relevant time. The court returned the case to Justice Arthur Engeron of the state Supreme Court in Manhattan so that he can determine which parts can proceed that, you know, pursuant to statutes of limitations on any number of of, uh, criminal conduct. Again, this is a civil case, though. And October 2nd is when the trial is scheduled to begin, although uh, New York Attorney General Tish James told Pod Save America that she imagined that the uh, that her case, the two hundred fifty million dollar fraud case and the Manhattan District Attorney's, uh, you know, 34 fraudulent felony business falsification um, crimes uh, committed by Trump there with the with the hush money payments would be adjourned, likely, likely, she said, adjourned, which just means paused uh, until the documents, the DOJ felony documents, classified documents case was uh, was finished. So we'll see what happens uh, with that. Um, she, honestly, she if, the, if it starts October, she could probably get it done. Well before the documents case ever goes yeah, to trial, I, I, I wonder how much she had thought about that comment that uh, she would likely adjourn it before that it was really settled when the trial was the federal documents trial was likely to be because I can easily well we'll know some coming up uh, you know particularly as we start getting into the beginning of SEPA litigation on the documents case we'll start to have some idea how much Trump and his attorneys are going to want to fight this and if you start seeing like filings arguing unconstitutionality of SEPA, you know they're in it for the fight and they're going to delay as much as they can if they're kind of moving well, It's already been delayed till December 11th. So. Right. And and we still, had, I mean, I think well, Walt is still looking for local counsel. And so, you know, there was a, another week delay. But again, to your point, I can see, like, particularly if we don't go to the documents case trial until mid next year, there's plenty of time to get an October 2nd trial done up in New York, even with, you know, a month or two of delay. So we'll see what she says. Again, Fonny Willis, I think, you know, last I heard down in Georgia, you know, because uh, um, James had said, well, I think we all might, all the state things might be adjourned. And Fonny Willis has just said, well, you know, hold on, no. that, you know, speak for yeah. yourself sort of thing. <laughs> so, um, yeah. you know, we'll see what happens there. But I don't think, you know, again, legally, it there's nothing harmful there for the state of New York. Allison, and, and one last thing, just to kind of bring this whole discussion, you know, full circle of where we started. If you're talking about a, the Trump and his family business allegedly engaged in a staggering fraud, you mean to tell me there is no federal tax crime there? You mean all this evidence of false valuations on the one hand, minimizing things for tax purposes, maximizing things for loan purposes. There's no financial or tax related crime in there whatsoever from a federal perspective. And meanwhile, we have, you know, quote unquote, whistleblowers complaining about, you know, whether or not, you know, when when Hunter Biden signed some record for a firearm certifying that he hadn't been convicted of a crime. Fine. A crime is a crime is a crime. 
And if you break the law, you should be investigated. And if you can establish that you broke the law, you should be prosecuted. But don't tell me if you're getting so worked up over a you know false statement on a firearms application that hundreds of millions of dollars of alleged potential tax fraud is not maybe a smidge more relevant and important to the good operation of our nation's tax system, of our powerful and wealthy to hold them to account. I just, I don't, the, the, the utter silence, the not a peep of concern that this potential crime is not being investigated in the same way says a lot to, in my mind, the sort of underlying motivations of the people who are coming forward and argue that maybe kind of possibly there's some political motivations rather than just straightforward <laughs> whistleblower claims. Yeah. And we know recently uh, our friend Mimi Roca, who is the DA in Westchester, um, closed her investigation into uh, tax fraud up in, in Westchester, saying that other agencies were pursuing these charges. Uh, and that's one of the reasons that we're closing this. There was some statute of limitations considerations and other agencies are pursuing some of this, whether she means the New York district, the, the Manhattan district attorney, whether she means the Southern district of New York, whether she means the IRS, none of that is clear. Uh, but it is of note. And we brought it up at the time that 17 count conviction for tax fraud brought by the Manhattan district attorney's office for the Trump organization mentioned federal tax crimes. The word federal came up 25 times in just that indictment itself. So it's it's of note that we haven't heard a peep about any federal agency or any U.S. Attorney's Office, meaning federal agency, or any or the IRS or the Treasury criminally investigating the Trump Organization tax fraud. And I think that that could be a sleeper case. I, I can't imagine they're not. It would be so weird if no one is criminally looking at that, unless they decided, hey, Manhattan DA is looking at this and, and we'll let them go. I mean, just let it happen with them. It just doesn't seem like something the feds would do, but I don't know. Yeah, I don't either. I would hope that if that was going on at some point, we would hear it. The question would be, is that something that you'd incorporate into Jack Smith? I don't. My sense is that the scope of the appointment order would not include you know, sort yeah, of historical tax violations. But again, you know, and, and Tish James said, you know, I'm referring this, I've referred this to the prosecutors in Manhattan as well as to the IRS. And, but like everything else, you would expect at some point when any investigation, any complex investigations gets to a certain point, you start having people talking about it, right? Witnesses, st you know, whether they have been interviewed by the government, whether they've gone into the grand jury, they or their attorneys want to start sculpting the narrative to make them look good or to minimize their exposure. And we haven't heard, like, you know, you get like financial companies or who are, you know, producing documents or getting asked about things and getting subpoenaed for all these things. Now, it could be that New York already gathered it all. And so yeah. maybe the bulk of the information is already in the government's hands. But I, if this is a active federal investigation, I do think we will, if it is active and if it is moving to charges, I am willing to bet that we get some sort of hint or indication as before any charges from those yeah. people who are close around. And, and we haven't, yeah. to your point, we haven't heard anything about you'd it. You'd have to bring them into a federal grand jury. You can't just always rely on what the right. state hands you. Uh, but I will say this, uh, Damian Williams is wont to announce no charges being brought against high level cases. When Rudy Giuliani and his, the Southern District of New York's investigation into his Ukraine shenanigans uh, ended in, in no charges, uh, Damian Williams actually made a declination statement. He didn't say why or anything, because the DOJ doesn't have to do that like a special counsel does. But he did say, hey, we, we investigated the Rudy Ukraine stuff. We're not going to bring charges. This is a high level case. That's why I'm telling you. Uh, I can't imagine the Trump organization wouldn't also be grouped into something considered a high level case at the Southern District of New York. And if they are investigating, they haven't, I, in my mind, declined to prosecute. Otherwise, we probably would have gotten a statement. But if they're not at all, we wouldn't know. Right. And I, I, I mean, who knows? We're, we're getting quickly into like the pure speculation realm. But I mean, one thing to consider is like, A, that, you know, New York and SDNY and EDNY2 have always had a reputation of being very aggressive. They're not going to just sit on something and let it die unless, you know, you're Bill Barr trying Let's to put the bar, squeeze yeah. on Berman. And, and, but, you know, absent those extraordinarily corrupt circumstances of a Bill Barr's attorney general, they are 
typically very independent, very aggressive U.S. attorney's offices. They're certainly well aware, as is Maine Justice, about the impending election season and if they're going to announce any sort of charges to want to get the bulk of the investigation done and the charges made and indicted prior to you know, the, the general election, certainly in earnest, but you know, they're yeah, kind of like ex- now, like yeah, now you're, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah you're no, off. right. No, the next, so again, I think they're, you know, if I'm there, it would not surprise me at all to be sitting there looking at the clock and saying, Hey, we're in July and we need to figure out what the hell we're doing one way or the other. And if there's a prosecutable case, we need to get that tr- at a minimum charged, you know, sometime in the next few months going into fall. So, you know, stay tuned. Um, we, we, I, I just, everything we know, it would be, I, I, I think it is reasonable to believe that there was crime going on. The question is always, can you prove it? And that's, you know, the gap, as we're all seeing now, the gap between what you believe to be the case and what you can prove are, are very, very different things. Yeah. And not just, you know, maybe we don't bring the charges for the, you know, inflated gifts, the stuff that was brought, against, you know, by the Manhattan DA against the Trump organization for all of the gifts that weren't counted as salary. Um, with was with Weiselberg signing off on that, but maybe you know. But I'm just talking about straight up looking at the valuation, uh, yeah. asset valuation fraud, uh, and the Seven Springs Estate uh, easement, conservation easement fraud, and I mean, there's just so many federal right and tax the federal things when it comes to like here. yeah, and mortgage fraud and loans, and if you're making false statements to anything from the KYC, from know your customer My statements to your you know, and you're, I'm trying to get a loan from Deutsche Bank or Citibank or her, you know, JP Morgan or whatever it is, and I'm certifying my assets are worth, you know, two hundred and seventy million dollars, but the reality is I went to the IRS and I claimed for tax purposes they're only worth hundred and ten million dollars. I mean, there there are certainly when it comes to loaning and lending and federal crimes that attach to that, there are some things there that I think would be very applicable to this alleged pattern of behavior. Um and on the kind part of, of low hanging fruit, from, honestly. I, one would think. One would think. You know, right? I mean it, Unless you're like, well, we generally just ask for them to pay their taxes back and we don't charge them. And then, like you said, everybody's up in arms. Uh, like like who? Thing. Like Hunter Biden? Right, right, mm-hmm. right, right. Yeah. Yeah. Except he just didn't pay taxes for two years and then paid and paid penalties. Anyway, we could yeah. talk for hours, my friend. But that's the show. We appreciate you all. Thanks to our patrons. We'll be around this weekend with who knows what the hell is going to happen this week in any of these cases. Uh, but thank you so much again. Um, for listening to Clean Up on Al 45. We really appreciate it. We will see you next week. We'll see you this weekend if you're a patron. And uh, until then, I've been Allison Gill. And I'm Pete Strzok. Clean Up on Al 45 is written, researched, and produced by Allison Gill with editing by Molly Hockey. Our art and logo designer by Joelle Reeder and Moxie Design Studios. And our music is composed and performed by Adam Orr. Clean Up on Aisle 45 is a proud member of the MSW Media Network, a collection of creator-owned podcasts dedicated to news, politics, and justice. For more information, visit mswmedia.com. MSW Media.